Hello there, and welcome to the channel. I'm Travis, and we're going to be doing something a little bit different today. I'm going to attempt to do a review or a retrospective of a 1999 first-person horror game by From Software, the esteemed creators of the Armored Core franchise, the Dark Souls franchise, and most recently Elden Ring to name a few. I discovered this gem of a PlayStation 1 game after having finished all of the modern From, From Software titles that were out at the time. I decided that while I was looking forward to the release of Elden Ring, I would also take the time to look back. Back through From Software's extensive catalog to see what else I could find that would be interesting to experience and explore. There was one game's title in particular that stood out to me. I'm not exactly certain as to why, but I felt drawn to it, and compelled to see what it had to offer, and I must say that I was not disappointed in the slightest. So without further ado, come with me as we look back at Echo Knight. Let's start with the trailer for the game. Just a quick disclaimer, uh, this video is going to be rife with spoilers for the game, so if you think that it's something you would like to experience for yourself, I suggest you go play it and then come back to this video after. It will still be here, but your chance at going into this experience blind will not. Now then, what exactly was so compelling about Echo Knight? Was it the graphics? The controls? The mechanics? The narrative? Or perhaps the atmosphere? We're going to discuss all of these individual elements and how they coalesce to form something much greater than I had imagined. Let's start with the graphics. I know that they may seem quite dated and pretty subpar by today's standards, but for those of you watching who didn't experience gaming in the 90s, especially on console, this was actually really well done. When playing Echo Knight in the modern day, what it comes down to for me is not so much the visual quality of the environments and character models, so much as it is how well these things convey the information, atmosphere, and emotion that is needed to progress and build suspense and fear in the player. However, having grown up long enough ago to remember playing the PS1 the year this came out, I choose to see the game mostly through a lens of what it could have looked like had the developers not been so limited by the technology of the time. Now let's talk about the controls, or at least the version of the controls that I chose given that there are four available. Uh, select opens your menu which gives you access to inventory, notes, settings, and a map once you've acquired it. Start pauses the game without opening the menu. Triangle allows you to inspect objects to get a short description of what you're looking at, in case you weren't too sure, and to equip items that are accessories in the inventory menu. Uh, circle allows you to crouch. The cross button allows you to interact with the environment. The square button allows you to use items that you have in your inventory. Uh, the directional pad is used to move your character forward, back, left, and right and L1 and R1 are used to swivel the camera view left and right, as well as L2 and R2 being used to swivel the camera up and down. Now most of those controls seem relatively standard, but those last few would probably be considered a sin or a crime by modern game design standards, and rightfully so. But you need to keep in mind that this game was released on a console that did not have joysticks on its controller. 
before joysticks on gaming controllers were even a common thing. And despite how finicky the camera control is when you're used to using a joystick, to this game's credit, I honestly can't think of many other games from this era of gaming that gave you full 3D camera control from a first-person perspective. This was a time where most first-person shooters were still locking the camera rotation to a single axis, or giving you a secondary reticle that worked independent of the camera's rotation to allow you to shoot up and down. As far as mechanics are concerned in Echo Knight, there are few, but are very well utilized for the purposes of storytelling and gameplay. The primary pull of the gameplay is the puzzle solving, and the full 3D camera control as well as the ability to crouch gives the devs the liberty to utilize nearly every inch of the environment from top to bottom for hiding items, hints, and puzzle solutions. Certain objects such as furniture can be picked up and moved around, which is needed to solve several of the game's puzzles, from the very first puzzle which truly kicks off your adventure, and much further into the game where you have to uh, move a stepping stool to the other side of the room to be able to access a vent that is up near the ceiling. You can use most of the items that you pick up either on yourself as tools for solving certain puzzles or even for gaining access to a certain shifty merchant, and I'm fairly certain that every object you come across has at the very least one use. There are also ghosts or demons that you come across in the game that block your passage and provide a challenge to the player since they can only be expelled by exposing them to light. Which starts out simple enough, but gets progressively more complicated as you find sections where the power needs to be restored, where the obvious light switch doesn't work and they've hidden another one, or where the spirits themselves are preventing you from getting to the light switch. And finally, aside from the standard ones, such as walking around and talking to non-player characters, interacting with certain items and non-player characters will actually transport you to important or unresolved moments in the past in which that item or person was relevant, which leads us nicely into the narrative or story of Echo Knight. The year is 1937. You are a young American man by the name of Richard Osmond. You're at home examining an envelope that you received from your estranged father, whom you haven't heard from since you left home. The only thing enclosed within the envelope is a small key that you have no recollection of, and as you begin to question exactly what he was trying to tell you with this key, the phone behind you rings. You pick it up only to find that it's the Anchor City Police Department calling because they would like to ask you questions regarding your father. The screen fades to black, and when it fades back in, you find yourself in a car with the police officer you spoke to over the phone, pulling up to what appears to be the abandoned, burnt-out remains of the house. It was your father's house. The officer leads you inside and gives you the freedom to look around while you're here, and as you explore the ashen remains of the home, you come across a winding key lying on the floor, and later an old long case clock, or as it's more commonly known, a grandfather clock, to which both the winding key and the key you received in the envelope belong. Upon winding the clock, the time jumps forward to 3 o'clock, and the entire clock slides away to reveal a hidden passage just behind. As you crouch down and crawl your way through the secret passage, you find a journal bound in red leather lying on the floor. Examining the journal, you find yourself suddenly pulled in, into the pages, into the memories that it contains. The screen flashes to white, and as your vision clears, you find that you're no longer in the passage where you were, but rather looking out onto a train platform, as one train pulls out and another grinds to a halt at the station. When the train does finally come to a full stop, your eyes may come to focus on a young man with light hair boarding in front of you. The train departs, and as it leaves the station, you are brought back into the first person. Now on the train, you are given back control and left to explore. In the car with you, you will find a service attendant, as well as the young man you watched aboard the train prior. As you explore the train, you'll find your way into the next car, where you'll find an old man sitting with a young child. You chat with them, finding out from the girl that the old man is her grandfather, who brought her on this trip despite the fact that she didn't want to come, and as you leave the car back the way you came, you cross paths with the young man who is now also switching cars. As you try to re-enter, you find that the door is locked, leaving the first car you came from as the only direction to go. Uh, you find the service attendant now lying on the ground, either unconscious or possibly dead. But next to him you find a hand crank of sorts, which if you now take and go climb the ladder that you may or may not have noticed next to the now locked door, you can find a hatch in the roof of the locked car that can be opened to observe what's going on inside. And my oh my what a scene you stumble across here. Let me just insert a small clip from my playthrough here. Youth, what are you doing? 
Maybe you didn't hear me. Drop your weapon or I will kill her. Are you mad? She's your granddaughter. Yes, she's my cute little granddaughter, but you're after me. You loathe me, not her. Have you the heart to take an innocent soul? Damn you! I knew you were after me for quite some time now. I'm well prepared. In my opinion, you're not suited for this. You're too damn ominous and righteous. You're too nice to kill. But I guess that is one reason why you've made it this far. My granddaughter's life is in your hands. What shall it be? This guy's a piece of shit. <laughs> Looks like I win. Foolish boy. Just kicks him in the head. Holy shit. Sir, is everything alright? Old oh, man, shut up! <laughs> Damn, son. It's nothing. You didn't hear a thing. Take this. Oh, yes, but... Okay. <laughs> the, the stone... Are you okay? I'm sorry. I scared you. Do you like your grandfather? My grandfather is scary? Yeah, no shit. Your grandfather has been possessed by demons. I've been chasing that demon with this blue stone. Keep this piece with you until we meet again. It will protect you from anything. May I ask your name? Priya Rockwell. I'm Henry. Henry Osmond. We shall meet again. Goodbye, Kriya. So that's, uh, I believe our character's father right there. I believe we've been transported to the past. Damn fool, he should have just taken the money and left. He shouldn't die that easily. Can't you see? You're possessed by that stone. I can't die, not like this. That will be enough gibberish. You shall die now. Alright. This will not be the last of me, William Rockwell. Just throws himself off the train. Run, you coward. Possessed by this stone. Ha 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 ha. I will never hand this over. Not to anyone. It's more like a dagger than a stone, really. So now you find yourself back in the present day at your father's home, and as you continue down the passage, you come to this room containing two statues, or rather busts, and a painting of those two same busts facing each other. So you re rearrange the ones in the room to match the painting, and you find that the painting changes to show a ship out at sea. As you look at the painting, you once again find yourself being pulled in. Fade to white, fade back in, and now you're on the Orpheus yourself, standing on the deck staring out at the ocean. The sun is setting, and the clouds are blowing past. You're almost immediately confronted by the captain of the ship, who takes you into a room and instructs you not to leave under any circumstances. You, of course, do not listen. And once you've finished exploring the room that you were confined to, you find yourself outside on the deck again, where you encounter one of the ghosts or demons that I referred to earlier for the first time in the game's first attempt at a jump scare of sorts. Let me show you. Oh, hello. See, it didn't actually scare me, but it still gave me chills. 
Um, can can I move? Okay, there we go. It's the light. They're not fond of light. And then this voice that seems to know you tells you more or less that they are dealing with it and to stay put. You, of course, do not listen. And as you continue not listening, you come across the lingering souls of the long-deceased passengers of the Orpheus. Each one requiring some kind of resolution to move on from the world, whether that be grievances or regrets from the past, or unresolved issues in the present. Like, for example, the first crewman you are likely to come across who is lamenting his decision to leave his girl behind and board the Orpheus. After speaking to him, you are pulled into his memories, into that heartbreaking day that he regrets when he had to leave her behind and go out to sea. You get to meet her, and you find her the engagement ring that she lost at the carnival after he proposed. She hasn't been willing to go see him until she finds it, and when you do finally find it for her, she runs to see him. It's too late. He's gone. They never even got the chance to say goodbye, and he's never coming back. You'll come across many of these spirits and many of these tragic tales as you travel through the depths of the Orpheus, and for each one that you help move on, you'll be awarded an astral piece, a translucent orb of glowing energy that appears to be the soul itself. These don't come into play until you've solved a few of these problems and found yourself back in the room where you were told to stay with a pair of wire cutters, to open the cabinet and acquire the comet book, or rather, until it acquires you. Once this happens, you'll get the chance to meet the shifty merchant I had referred to earlier. I'll let him introduce himself. Ugh. Please, come in. Coming in. You got an interesting little, uh, little place here, bud. What's up? So how goes your journey aboard the ship? It seems pretty fun. Fun, sure, yeah. You don't have to be scared. I just possess an alien power. Oh yeah, nothing to be scared of. I am blind. I created that book you possess as a substitute. Interesting. I am able to see the world through the book as it travels around the world. Yes, the entire world. <laughs> What's this? You have something interesting. Do I now? I speak of the sphere you possess. Will you give it to me? Well, in layman's terms, let's just say that it is another type of energy. All right. I have a certain goal I am trying to achieve. I need that sphere. Of course I shall reward you with something that will be of use to you. Will you now? How about it? Is there a way I can persuade you? Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks. This is a special potion. It may be weak, but it has the power to cure you when you are possessed. When I'm possessed. I believe this will be very useful for you. <laughs> hmm. So I can get possessed? With that book, you are able to come here whenever you like. Come again. I'll be waiting. I feel like, uh, I don't oh, I trust this dude. Let me give this to you. This stone holds your destiny. Take good care of it. Alrighty. <laughs> so it's very similar to the stone we gave the little girl. Or that uh, our father gave the little girl. Broken stone, pick it up. From here, you are thrust back out into the ship, at which point you'll be able to access the lower decks and continue unraveling the mystery of what happened to her and her people. Following a mostly linear path through the lower decks, and finding clues and items to solve puzzles as you go. Let's go through some of the puzzles and encounters that really stood out to me. Like for example a three-part puzzle involving a man sitting on the floor of the hallway who wants nothing more than to have a drink that his friend used to make for him. In order to get him the drink he's looking for, you first need to learn the tragic fate of his friend Ed who was possessed and driven mad. In what were likely some of Ed's last moments of sanity, his thoughts were of his foolish drunkard of a friend, 
and he carved a clue to making the drink into the table of his room. You come to find that the solution is hidden within a painting in the nearby bar. A rendition of a barbarian, brandishing an axe in one hand and tightly gripping a snake in the other hand as another in the foreground prepares to attack. Upon giving him the drink, he laughs like a fool, realizes that he can't taste a thing, and that he has no need for a drink if he's already dead. He then asks you to free Ed from the makeshift prison they put him in after he went mad and tells you where to find the uh, quote-unquote keys. And finally, he finds it within himself to let go, to finally accept what happened to him and move on. Or, for example, the twin sisters in opposite rooms of which you can only reach one due to a malevolent spirit pushing you away from the other. There are two subtle clues to this puzzle that in combination help to naturally lead the player to conclude the solution in a wonderful fashion. The first is the dialogue of the sister that you are able to reach, who tells you that she knows everything about her sister because they are exactly the same, even knows if you talk to her, to her sister first. The second is a detail you'll likely notice as you're leaving either of the rooms, in that as you leave the room and close the door behind you, you'll also see the door of the room opposite you closing. The astute may have already come to the conclusion that it's not only the sisters that are twins, but the rooms themselves, and because of this, anything you move in one room also moves in the other. This allows you to move a heavy radiator in front of the bathroom door that the spirit comes out of to prevent it, it from pushing you back also allowing you to turn on the lights to ward it off. I love this. I love how it doesn't hold the player's hand and highlight the solution, but also makes sure you have all the tools to figure it out on your own. It's a respect of the player's intelligence that many games don't feel the need to provide. You'll continue solving puzzles and uncovering the fate of everyone aboard the ship, as well as a few others, as you find your way deeper inside, all the while also learning the fates of the old man and the little girl you met on the train. You'll also come across your father down the road when you are almost killed by an evil spirit and he comes in at the last moment to save you. Let me play that for you now. Ow, dude. Wait, what? Who turned on the lights? Hello? So you've come all this way. My soul has been uneasy ever since oh, I sent you that letter. my father. Okay. I'm no longer the same person I was when I first met that girl. The red stone. William. What have I come this far for? You learn that William is not the first of the Rockwells to have possession of the Red Stone, as we come to see that the evil spirit that your father saved you from was an old king who was murdered by an ancestor of the Rockwells by the name of Alan who took the stone for himself. The little girl from the train, whose name is Crea, held on to that stone that your father gave her all those years ago, and with the help of the stone and her knowledge of her grandfather's evil, she dedicated herself to thwarting him. At one point in the past, he took the stone from her and imprisoned her. You find your way back to a moment where she was imprisoned, and with the help of a music box given to you by the spirit of her brother, you convince her that you're a friend and show her that you have the other half of the blue stone. This is when she decides that she will get her half of the blue stone back, even if it is to cost her her life. She gives you one of her earrings to give to her brother, and she sends you on your way. You also learn that the red stone is an ancient evil thing that allows men to achieve greatness, to rule kingdoms, and amass great wealth in exchange for the souls of others. Little is known of the blue stone, except that it is said to be an opposite to the red stone, and that there are only two rules known for how to use them. Don't sacrifice too many souls to the redstone if you wish to maintain a strong destiny, and under no circumstances combine the two stones. You come to find out that the reason the Orpheus is out here in the first place is because the ship belonged to the Rockwells. William's children, Jack and Amelia, had brought their father out here to die for all that he's done. But they unfortunately failed and William killed them, as well as the entire crew. 
and then after dispatching the old king's spirit, you'll finally find yourself face to face with William Rockwell, sitting in a chair in a grand room, rapidly bleeding to death from the stab wound he sustained to the abdomen. He tells you that his journey has finally come to an end. He questions why he did everything he did. Now that he no longer possesses the redstone, or rather it no longer possesses him, he is lost. He can't remember what this was all for. He can't even remember that Kreia is his granddaughter. But he does remember that she was waiting for you. That she fought for both you and your father, and holds up a crystal ball through which you see her final moments. She made good on her promise. She got the stone back, and it did indeed cost her her life. But perhaps that can be changed, and through William you are able to access the moment of her demise and change her fate, taking the bullet that would end her life before it ever makes its way into the gun. But before this, William tells you that the Red Stone now has hold of your father, and by the time you come back from saving Kriya and acquiring the other half of the Blue Stone, William is dead. On the table next to him, you find the key to the engine room, which is the only which is one of the only rooms that you couldn't access at this point. So that's where you go next, and this is where you finally catch up to your father. Now driven mad by the power of the Red Stone, he declares that he finally understands that this is what he wanted all along, and says that even your Blue Stone will not survive in this darkness. Then he collapses, and the power of the stone manifests itself in the form of William Rockwell, who now chases you down with an insatiable ferocity, passing through walls to keep coming at you as you scramble to turn the lights on and be rid of him. Once he's been dealt with, you find your way back to your father, and despite the rules stated in the Legend of the Stones, you combine the two, causing a catastrophic reaction that leaves you with little more than a minute to live. And before expiring, your father, who is no longer possessed by the stone at this point, tells you to hurry to the front of the ship. When you make it to the front of the ship, you find Kriya's spirit waiting for you. She leads you into a room, tells you that you don't belong here, and that the ship's life is coming to an end, and then she sends you home essentially booting you out of this memory as you watch the Orpheus and her crew, finally at rest, disappear in a flash of golden light. And as the sun rises on the now empty stretch of ocean, you find yourself waking up back in your father's house, in the room where you found the clock. Nothing on your person, just like before you went in, the policeman telling you that it's time to go since there's nothing to find here. With explaining what just happened not being a realistic option, you follow the officer outside to his car. He tells you not to look so depressed and suggests that your father may still show up one day, and then he tries and fails to start the car. After several attempts, he asks you to grab the tools out of his trunk for him, so you go around to the back of the vehicle, you open up the trunk, and what's there? The dagger with the red stone. Roll credits. Or at least that's the ending I got. Upon further research, I came to find out that, as I suspected, there are multiple endings to the game, and my overall completion was fairly low, so there are no doubt several things that I missed, like little side stories and maybe even some relatively important plot points. But despite that, it still felt like a complete experience. There are actually four endings which go as follows. The first, where you don't make it off the ship before the time runs out. In this case, both you and your father are decla declared missing under mysterious circumstances. The next is the one I got, where you make it out and find the knife in the trunk. If you've done 100% completion up to this point, and you've collected all the astral pieces, you may have made your way back to the merchant to offer him up the last of them, and he'll tell you this. It must have been tough collecting this many. This will be enough. By the way, have you ever had any doubts about why I am so interested in collecting these things? <laughs> I'll show you the answer to that question. This is the rock of all miracles. It has the power to grant you any wish. The greatest treasure of mankind, it is the Devil's Red Stone. This stone belongs to you. We shall meet again when your fate with the other Red Stone comes to an end. When that time comes, we shall meet again. After this revelation, the game continues as normal, right up until the point where you are fleeing the ship. 
Right before you go into the room where Kriya's spirit sends you home, you may have noticed another sun symbol like the other one you've been using to access the Merchant Doll game. If you find your way in here before it's too late, you'll have two options which lead into our last two endings. If you so choose, the merchant who is presumably the devil at this point will give you the stone he showed you before. When you escape with it, rather than leaving with the police officer, you stab him in the back. This is arguably the worst ending from a moral standpoint. Else you can refuse the knife when offered, which is arguably the best ending overall. The merchant seems intrigued at this refusal. He tells you that you are a very strange man before shattering the blade and wishing you a bright future. At which point you find yourself at home listening to Kriya's music box as her final thoughts play out in text format. Was this all fate, she wonders? Was it really unavoidable? But rather than dwelling on it, she says for you to look upon the music box and reminisce of all the people you quote-unquote saved. And this is the story of Echo Knight. It's not necessarily the most original narrative ever put to a game, but it is executed with such a level of elegance that makes it hard to fault, and this is in great part due to the game's ability to build atmosphere. From start to finish, this game is absolutely dripping with atmosphere. Like the way the rooms have an eerie lack of tone up until you turn on the lights and they pop with incredible color and beauty as you get to feast your eyes on the mind-blowing attention to detail in almost every corner of the environment. And the way the game is silent for the most part, almost oppressively so, save for the sound of your own footsteps throughout, as well as important and or high tension moments where they bring in music to add even more to the atmosphere, and this is a wonderful choice. Letting the players stew in silence and mull over what they've learned so far allows the music to come in and really accentuate the emotion of the scene. I myself am not normally very affected by horror media, and this game successfully made my hair stand on several occasions and may have even gotten a jump or two out of me. I think that really comes down to the atmosphere more than anything else. It's one thing to have scary monsters that are rendered in incredibly realistic detail that look like horror, but without the atmosphere to go along with it, it if it can't make you feel like you're in your character's shoes, it can't truly be horrifying. Like Doom, for example. It has all the visual trademarks of a horror experience. Monsters from hell in various disgusting forms, confusing architecture that makes no realistic sense to keep the player in the level and vulnerable longer, and eventually, you literally go to hell. But part of what makes Doom an action game rather than a horror game is the tone, and the competence of the protagonist as a trained soldier with the experience and capabilities, as well as the fact that they are always moving forward without hesitation. And that's not to say that Doom doesn't have atmosphere, but said atmosphere is completely different. In Echo Knight and most horror experiences, on the other hand, the capabilities of the protagonist to deal with the situation and keep moving forward are consistently called into question, and when it's done right, the visuals and mechanics will be helping to reinforce that feeling of powerlessness. And in my humble opinion, as a regular guy who's been playing video games for almost 25 years, Echo Knight does it right. In conclusion, I'll say that I honestly believe this game deserves to be remade for modern hardware with the level of graphical fidelity that we are able to achieve now, possibly even with VR support because I think it would suit this game well, and I know FromSoft have already dabbled in that area. Despite how much I enjoyed the game, and think it's still worth playing today, the control scheme is a hurdle that I feel a lot of younger and otherwise impatient people will not get past, and I really just want to see this thing the way the devs did in their minds as they were building it. So if you agree, do me a favor and go hound the devs on Twitter or something to give us an Echo Knight remake. It's not likely to work, but it would be incredible if it did. If you've made it this far, I really appreciate you taking out the time to listen to me ramble about this ancient piece of software. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please leave them below. I will likely be doing at least one or two more of these videos. However, if they end up doing well and people enjoy them, I'll probably keep doing them for the foreseeable future. Speaking of which, if you did enjoy the video, please leave a like. I have no idea if it helps with the algorithm, but it at least helps a little bit with my sense of self-esteem when it comes to putting something like this together. And if you really enjoyed the content and want to help support me in my goal of making entertainment my career, please consider supporting with a one-time donation through PayPal at the link below, or a monthly donation on Patreon, which has several tiers that come with a variety of rewards for your support. We have big plans for the future, from video games to animated films and shows, right up to eventually feature-length films as well as art and various other projects. Make sure to subscribe to not miss out. Thanks for watching.